Well, thanks, team, for uh, leading us this morning. Uh, it's been a great morning to celebrate together and uh, Amanda's baptism. It's been awesome. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray as we pause around uh, God's word this morning. Jesus, we want to thank you for your scriptures. Uh, we thank you that they are alive and active and speak to us uh, consistently and regularly. And Lord, we pray that as we open the word today, that we would be attentive to your spirit and mindful of the things that you are asking of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it was a Tuesday morning of December, not December, of uh, 2015, and it was a regular staff meeting at uh, the church I was at. We were, uh, you know, had our time together. And in that meeting, uh, my phone rang, and I looked down, and it was my sister. I thought, well, that's unusual. She doesn't often ring me. I thought, I'll ring her back later and uh, declined the call. And uh, about 20 minutes later, there was a text from my brother. Uh, so I was living in Canberra at the time. Uh, he lived in Mackay. And uh, the text was like, I'm going to New Zealand. What are you doing? I was like, hmm, this sounds interesting. Um, so I uh, paused our staff meeting and uh, rang my sister. And my sister let me know that my dad was in hospital, uh, that he wasn't well, and um, yeah, it might be a good idea to come. And I could hear dad in the background going, he doesn't have to come, as parents do, right? And uh, anyway, so got off the phone, uh, had a quick chat to the staff, and then uh, sort of said, I need to make some plans. I called my brother and found out what he was doing. Uh, so we managed to synchronise flights. We, we met in Christchurch, and uh, we hired a car late, Christchurch, uh, late in the evening and uh, drove through the night from Christchurch to Nelson, got a few hours sleep, and then uh, went to the hospital the next day and, and had... Uh, you know, uh, a number of rich conversations with my dad and uh, had a little nap in the middle of the day, went back again at the night and uh, caught up and uh, we, we had a great time as the family gathered together and there. It was uh, about 6am the next morning um, that my dad had passed from this life to the next. And it was one of those moments where you get one of those calls and I know for some people these last couple of years you haven't had the same freedom. You haven't had the opportunity to travel, to go where you've needed to be when you felt you needed to be there. Uh, I, I had that privilege, had that opportunity. And there were just some moments and some times that you kind of drop everything because it's that important, right? You just go, I need to be there. And, and that's what we did. And I'm grateful that we had the opportunity. Today we're looking at a passage of scripture from John 11, uh, the, uh, the first 44 verses. Now, I'm not going to read them this morning. I'm going to give you a bit of a snapshot as we wander our way through the scripture. But it is the story of where Jesus raises Lazarus back to life. Now, some of you would be familiar with that. But there are some really interesting moments within this story. Because what happens is uh, Lazarus, he becomes sick and uh, Mary and Martha, the two sisters of Lazarus, they, they reach out to Jesus because Jesus was their friend. And they knew something of who Jesus was. So they send a message. Jesus, can you come? Lazarus is sick. And then there is this curious verse that we read here. Verse 4, it says, But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Now, I don't know about you, that's an odd scripture. Someone who is close to Jesus has reached out and said, can you come? This is desperate. It's not like he broke a nail or anything, right? This is serious. And Jesus, and it's the scripture that says, because he loved them, he stayed where he was. It's almost counterintuitive, isn't it? When we go, if we love someone, we want to be there. You make the effort, you go, you do what you can. But Jesus, he waits. And some might go, well, he waited so that the greater miracle might happen, right? Because later on we read that Jesus gets there, Lazarus is dead, and then Jesus performs this amazing miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. But in that moment, for Mary and Martha, 
for Jesus not to come was quite a burden. And you're probably wondering why, what's going on? What's taking so long? Why didn't Jesus come? What's happening there? Mary and Martha have a, a rich relationship with Jesus. And eventually Jesus, he makes his way there. The disciples are trying to, you know, sort of go, actually, it's not a good idea because, you know, Bethany, where this happened, wasn't far from Jerusalem. And last time Jesus was near Jerusalem, they wanted to stone him. And they're kind of like, do you think this is a good idea? But he goes. And he approaches there. And as he comes into the place where Jesus is, he comes across Martha. And Martha says to Jesus, if only you were here, Lazarus would not have died. They knew the power that Jesus held. They knew that Jesus was a miracle worker. They'd seen or heard of the miracles that Jesus had performed. He cured people of their blindness. He gave people the ability to walk again. Surely keeping Lazarus alive wasn't that big an ask. Later on in the text, we hear that when you know, Mary finally hears that Jesus is there, she goes to him and she says to him, if only you were here, Lazarus would still be with us. You can sense in their voices like, you could have fixed it. You could have made it okay. You could have done something in this moment that would have been significantly better than what we are experiencing now. If only you have been here. I wonder if I asked for a show of hands of people who have cried out, hoping that Jesus would bring a transformation or a change in their circumstances, how much different and how much better it would be. If I asked for a show of hands, how many of us have been in that place going, yeah, if I could call out, knowing that Jesus can do something in this moment. And yet, our experience has been, but the circumstances played out as I expected they would. Now, I've been a pastor for almost 30 years. I know I look very young for my age. And and in that time, I have to tell you that I've come across a number of people who have been through that scenario where they've cried out with all their being, going, Jesus, if you could do something in this moment, if you could step in, if you could change the circumstances, if you could bring a healing, if you could bring reconciliation, if you could change what's happening in my circumstances here and now, life would be way better. And it would be for your glory and your honor, we could give you praise for all that you've done. And at the end of the day, things stay the same. And sadly, some of those people go, well, Jesus could have, but he didn't. And because he didn't, that's it. I'm done with God. Now, we might be sitting here going, I can understand that. When our heart gets broken, when we're emotionally drained, when we're really not up for it, when we really plead for something from God and God doesn't turn up as we expect, I can understand why someone might turn away. Maybe you've been there, maybe you've been on that fringe, maybe you have turned away, but here you are again. I don't don't know your stories. But what I find fascinating here with Mary and Martha is that they come to Jesus when he's in town. They don't reject him, they still turn up. And yes, they go with their question, yes, you could have made it different, you could have made it better, but you're here now. And we'll take you being here now. So as we read through this text, there's this interesting relationship that's taking place. They call out to Jesus. Jesus says, because he loves them, he waits. And then when he turns up, Mary and Martha, they don't shun him. They don't push him away. They don't go, oh, you could have. You could have been here a lot sooner. This could have been a lot different. But there's a sense that they turn up and they go, you could have made a difference, but but you're here now. We'll take you now as you are with us. 
Well, the story continues that Jesus asks, well, where is Lazarus? Obviously, he's in the tomb, right? It's been a few days. And he says, all right, I'll roll away the stone. What's really interesting is Martha pipes up. Martha goes, no, no, don't, don't do that. Don't roll away the stone. He's been in there for four days. And you know what happens to a body after four days in this heat? How many of you have been walking around a farm or down the street and you, you get a whiff of something and you kind of go, yeah, that's not nice. There's a sheep or a cow or often in Australia it was some roo off somewhere that had been hit by a car so when you, you'd be driving down the road with the window down and you go, whew, that's not pleasant. So you know, right, you know what Martha's saying, this, don't do it, Jesus. You, th- this is a mistake if you do this. It's got me thinking about how often do we put an excuse up when Jesus wants to do something when Jesus invites us to do something when Jesus says how about we do this and we kind of go oh that's not a good idea Jesus you know for, Mary, for Martha it was like don't do that because there's a bad smell what about for us what are the excuses we come up with when Jesus invites us to do participate in something oh that's not a good idea Jesus I really don't have that much time or actually I don't I can't really give that much because what will happen when I retire? I can't really serve in that ministry because, you know, I I'm, I'm really don't have the skills that are needed. I'm really not the right person for this. You want me to go to church every Sunday? What are you thinking? I've got other things to do on Sunday. In your own mind, think about the excuses time after time after time that we come up with where Jesus invites us into something. And we go, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. And I wonder how often when Jesus speaks to us about things in our life and he kind of goes, you know, we need, to, we need to do some work in this area. You know, your pride, your lust, your gossip, your unforgiveness your selfishness, all the things that we read that we sort of go, well, you know, God calls us to be different from some of our, our functions. And our response to Jesus is like, yeah, don't open that box. That one's a bit rank. We don't want to go there. You don't want to see what's in there if we actually go there because we're ashamed of it. And for some strange reason, many of us think that we can hide things from God. If I don't say it out loud, if I don't actually, you know, mention it, if I don't think about it, then God won't know this is what I'm really like. And we want to try and keep that little bit parked away. The only one who's been deceived in that whole scenario is ourselves right because God is all present God is all knowing he already knows who we are at our deepest level he knows who we are at our best and he knows who we are at our worst and the reality is he still loves you the same Scripture tells us that even while we were the enemies of God, God sent his son to die for us. While we're still as far away as we could be from God, he still came for us. There isn't anything more, anything about you that God is kind of like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. Not sure what we can do with that one. He already knows. And he invites you to bring that to the table. He invites you to come as you are, complete. To be unconditionally loved, unconditionally accepted into God's kingdom. What an amazing gift that is to us. And it's not just for those of us in the building, right? It's not just for those who are watching online. It's for everyone, 
this invitation to come as we are and experience the love and grace of God in our lives. And one of the things we need to remember as we think about this event that takes place, because what happens is the stone is rolled away and Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb. And the image is that he sort of wanders out with the grave clothes hanging off. And we talked about this at the staff meeting and someone, the youth pastor, (laughs) suggested that I wrap myself in toilet paper this morning like I'm a mummy. I said, I'm not doing that. I don't know why Nate didn't do it. He could have done it. He's a great prop. Um, But Lazarus wandered out from the tomb, resurrected, back to life. Imagine the crowd going, oh, wow, this is amazing. And we can look at that and go, well, that's the purpose, the point of why Jesus didn't come. He waited so that there'd be this bigger miracle, this bigger moment where people could stand in awe of God's power and God's wonder. But as I was reflecting on this, it reminded me that anything we experience of God in this world, any miracle that we might pray for or desire or hope for that we witness or experience a healing, a provision or anything like that, it is all temporary. The resurrection of Lazarus was a temporary fix because you know what? Lazarus is still not wandering around today. You know what that means? At some point in the future, he died again. Now, in that moment, Mary and Martha and the crowd were like, oh, we've got our brother back. This is amazing. The emotional welling up in that moment, I can only anticipate, was just overwhelming for them. But at some point in the future, Lazarus did die. He did pass from this life into the life to come. And I guess that's where we need to remember what the kingdom of God is about. There are moments, there are things in this world which are important that we are invited to participate in, but they are temporary. Our focus around the kingdom of God is knowing that the things that God calls us to are eternal, everlasting, never changing and even though we might have pain and suffering and grief and heartache in this life it's temporary because in the life to come the life that is promised in the kingdom of God there is no pain there are no tears there is no suffering we are fully in the presence of God The things of the flesh that slow us down, that trip us up, no longer exist. We are fully present in the kingdom of God. This is such a rich story that we have here about the kingdom of God, about Jesus. It's a little confusing as we read it about why did Jesus wait and then there's a resurrection and then there's all these things that take place. But in the middle of this text, we find this written down. In verse 25, I'll start a little earlier in verse 23. Jesus told her, speaking to Martha, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises in the last day. You see, Martha's understanding was that one day, God's goodness, God's kingdom would come in its fullness and there would be a resurrection of everyone. That was the anticipation. Yes, one day Lazarus will rise again. One day in the future when we all get to participate in what God has promised. Then Jesus says this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? So the promise is is that when we put our faith and our trust and our hope in God's faithfulness, God's goodness, God's mercy, God's grace, our physical being might go through a death, but our life will go on in God. 
That's the hope we had. And I guess ultimately, what we see in the Easter story, in the resurrection of Christ, because Jesus is the one who didn't die again after being raised. That wasn't a temporary solution. He continues to live. Scripture tells us that he ascended to be with the Father. So the promise we have is that Jesus promises us a focus on life. Life in this world, but life in the life in the life to come. That doesn't really sound right, but you know what I mean. There is something more for us in the kingdom of God. So we're going to take a moment to pray and then invite the team to, to come back up. And we've touched on a few different things. It was a large text that we looked at. And maybe for some of you, some of those areas we touched on, maybe you are sitting here and there is a, a weight around a disappointment with God because your, your heart cry was, Jesus, if you just turned up, it would be so different. Or maybe for some of us, we're sitting there with the excuses of why we don't. Why we don't participate in the things that God invites us to. The reasons we kind of go, yeah, it's too hard. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't like it. So I want to pray specifically about those couple of things. So would you join with me as we pray and then the, the team are just going to come to the front. Lord God, as we look at this amazing passage of the resurrection of Lazarus, we read in there some of the complexities of the relationship of where, you know, you, you loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus and they were your friends and yet you still paused. And then there was the miracle of the resurrection of Lazarus. And for some people, the cry of their heart is the same as what Mary and Martha had, the questions they had for, for Jesus in that moment. Of like, if you'd just been here, if you'd just turned up, it would have been different. And Lord, I know that for some people, we can carry that weight. We can carry that expectation that God, if you... If you'd just intervened, if you'd answered my prayer in a particular way, then, then I wouldn't have experienced this heartache, this loss, this brokenness, whatever it might be. And Lord, I want to ask this morning for those here this morning who have that weight, who have that, that burden, that, that may be creating a barrier between being able to go deeper with you and, and living that rich, full life, that you are Holy Spirit, will be able to bring a moment of reflection, a moment of healing and understanding. That even though the prayer wasn't answered as we might have hoped, we don't want to focus on the temporary fix. We want to, we want to focus on the eternal role of what it is to be in your family and to be connected to your story, to know that we are unconditionally accepted and loved as we are for who we are. So Lord, we, we invite your spirit to come and, and move amongst us. And Lord, some of us are, can be a bit like Martha when you suggest something, we kind of like, well, I don't think that's a good idea just as when the, the stone was asked to be rolled away, it's like, no, no, don't do that. Lord, for those of us who have maybe been saying, no, no, I don't, think, I don't think that's really the best idea, Jesus, I pray that you would help us, help us to deepen our trust in you. That we might increase in our faith to be faithful to you. To walk in the humility that says, I, I trust you, Jesus, more than I trust my own wisdom. I trust your word that calls us to love unconditionally those around us, to accept others, that we trust that more than our own bias or our own insecurities. And that we'd be faithful in pursuing that. 
I'm grateful for the privilege and opportunity we have together today. May your spirit continue to move amongst us and may you be glorified. In Christ's name, amen.